of God Almighty, the God of mercy, of grace, of truth, and of love. We've come this morning to thank him for Jesus and the gospel. We thank him for the Holy Spirit and the Church of Christ. We thank him for allowing us to be in the land of the living, that we may lift up the matchless and the mighty name of Jesus. I don't know about you, but I'm still glad to be in this house because God is in this house. Christ and the Holy Spirit are here. And we're just thankful that he allowed us to come to this place. It's good to see Sister Bowers. It's been a moment, but we thank God for her safety and that she was able to leave and return without any harm or danger. We've stayed connected, and so she still knows what's going on around here. <laughs> and we're just glad to, to, to have her back. Uh, to all of our visitors, thank you for coming and being with us in this service. And I know when you look around, you don't see all of the young people that you've been uh, used to seeing. They got on the bus this morning. I'm told they went to a mountain that's supposed to be magic. I just hope it can do something for them before they return. And so we want to pray for the young people and those who accompanied them. I know many people are looking for us to talk about the Supreme Court's decision legalizing same-sex marriages in all 50 states. The only thing I will say is this. I hope America has not just signed her death certificate on June 27, 2015. History has spoken. Sodom and Gomorrah destroyed because of homosexuality. They signed their death certificate. Homosexuality and homosexual activities were practiced by many of the Egyptian kings and Egypt failed. She signed her death certificate. Fifteen of the first 14 of the first 15 Roman emperors, Great Rome failed because they were homosexuals. She signed her death certificate. The Babylonian kings were practicing homosexuality. Babylon failed. She signed her death certificate. Even Alexandria the Great was a homosexual, a ruler and conqueror of the known world. The Grecian kingdom failed. She signed her death certificate. And I hope America today has not signed its death certificate because all of these great world empires failed because of their practicing of homosexuality. So today, I'm not going to deal with that. You go look in your history books and just look in your encyclopedias. They will tell you what I just told you. And so we don't have to argue about what God has said. Psalms 33 and verse number 4, For the word of the Lord is right in all of his works are done in truth. That's all I have to say. I've already preached forbidden fruit makes bad jam. I don't have to repeat that. 
We already know the truth here on that particular subject. So we're going to move on. I need to help the Figueroa Church of Christ with our everyday living and practices. Standing on the doctrine of Christ so that we can be presented to Christ as a chaste version and one day enjoy the bliss of we call heaven. So come with me to 1 Timothy chapter 3. Let me continue the series of lessons we've been dealing with for the past three or four weeks. 1 Timothy chapter 3, beginning at verse number 1. Are you there? This is a true saying. If a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach. What is the subject for today? The leadership in the local church, elders, part four. The leadership in the local church. Let's talk again about elders. I need to remind you as we go through the message why Paul sent Timothy, a young faithful gospel preacher, to the city of Ephesus. Come back to the book of 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. You need to understand why Timothy was sent to the city of Ephesus. The Bible says, as I besought thee, to abide still at Ephesus. When I went into Macedonia, that thou mayest charge some that they teach no other doctrine. Neither give heed to fables and endless genealogies which minister questions rather than godly edifying which is in faith so do. Please keep in mind that Timothy was sent to Ephesus to the church there to guard the church because there, were going, there was going to come a time when the church or the elders of the church will go into what we call apostasy. When you talk about apostasy, it simply means a falling away. You remember 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse number 1. I, I won't be long today because I need to make sure that everything is all right with you. Now, I need you to catch this. If I be too long, everything won't be all right with you. So I don't need to be too long. I, I need to say what I have to say and take my seat. Are you in 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse number 1? Paul said, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in this latter time some shall depart from the faith. Isn't that right? Giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their conscience sealed with a hot iron, Forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats. Is that in your Bible? Paul said to Timothy, the time is going to come when men will fall away from the truth. Paul used the word departure, which simply means they will leave. They will leave the faith. When the Bible was concluded and the books closed, there uh, was only one faith in the book. Are you all paying attention? He said some shall depart from the faith. There is no S on faith because there wasn't but one faith. You remember Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 5. I'll, I'll be there in a moment. Paul said, I therefore the prisoner of the Lord beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called with all lowliness and meekness and long suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, even as you're calling, one hope of your calling. Verse number five said, one Lord, one faith, 
one baptism. Am I correct about it? How many faiths? One faith. So Paul said the time is going to come when men shall depart from the faith. Now listen to this. He said their teachings will be number one. They will forbid marriage. Number two, they will abstain from meats. Did you all catch it? I maintain when people fell away from the truth, the first doctrine they started teaching was forbidding marriage. And whether you believe it or not, the Church of Christ was the first church, but the Roman Catholic Church was the first denomination. It departed from the faith. And guess what they were teaching? And they still teach it now. They were teaching certain people cannot marry. The popes can't marry. The cardinals can't marry. The archbishops can't marry. I'm trying to tell you, I used to wonder when I was growing up down in the Delta, Mississippi, we ate fish every Friday. And I didn't know why they served fish at school every Friday. But then when I got old enough and started reading enough, I found out that was one of Catholicism's main doctrines. Y'all don't have to say amen if you don't want to. Just act like you're not here. The Bible is still right. Am I correct about it? One faith. Men departed from that faith. Go to Acts chapter 20, verses 29 and 30. You remember when Paul called for the elders at Ephesus? That's Acts 20, 17. But when he gets to verse 29, he said, for I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. What's going to happen in this eldership? They are going to speak perversity. They are going to speak false doctrine they are going to draw away disciples after them are you listening you remember Colossians 3 or Colossians 2 and verse number 8 beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy vain deceit after the rudiment of the world and not after Christ after tradition of men after the rudiment of the world and not after Christ. Look at the three afters in that text. After the tradition of men. After the rudiments of the world. And not after Christ. So these elders drew men away based upon the tradition of men. They were not after Christ. Sometimes I even ask you, which after are you after? Some people don't know which after they're after. But you need to be after Christ. These elders departed from the faith. Some people think this is not important. But what you have to understand is this. John 8, 31 and 32. You have to understand that Jesus came, spake unto some Jew which believed on him and said, If you continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Is this important? I stop by to let you know when it comes to the word of God, we must follow his word. Oh, Bishop, and this brings me to uh, the qualification that I'm going to talk about today. A oh, Bishop. An elder, a pastor, an overseer, a shepherd, a presbytery, or even a steward must be blameless. Did you all catch the original text? I'm back at 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse number 2. You know, I've already dealt with the word blameless. I talked about it on last Sunday. Isn't that correct? It simply means that an elder must live a morally good life so that no charges that are brought against him can stick against them or stick when they bring them. You need to understand, elder, you ought to live irreproachable. 
That doesn't mean you are sinless, but it does mean you sin less. I don't mean it all. You know, I love to have a little fun every now and then when I preach, you know. A lot of people, well, you know, honey, I'm above sin. Let me tell you something. The only way you live above sin, you live on the third floor of your apartment building. There's some sinners under you. That's the only way you're above sin. Don't come in here talking to me like that. You know, I told you all last week about Mother Montgomery put her hands on a little feisty hip. Ninety years old told me Mother Montgomery doesn't have any sins. You all will be all right. I need to work on this thing this morning. I'm finished with blameless. I need to talk about this qualification or this quality they call the husband of one wife. Now, we have a lot of controversy in the church over what this really means. And so what I need to do today, I just need to try to share with you what the Bible says about it. A lot of controversy is over this issue. The husband of one wife, what does that mean? Well, let me help somebody. First of all, Paul destroys this idea of same-sex marriages. Y'all don't have to say amen, just don't go to sleep. You see, he said the husband of one wife. He didn't say the husband of one husband. He didn't say the wife of one wife. He said the husband of one wife. This term husband comes from a Greek word, A-N-E-R, is pronounced anir. The word means a man, an individual male, fellow, or sir. You need to catch this. When I say husband, I'm talking about a male. When I say husband, I'm talking about a man. Are you all listening? This term wife comes from a Greek word, gune, which simply means a woman, especially a wife. Somebody needs to pay attention. Paul says the husband of one wife. Therefore, Timothy could not ordain a woman for a bishop. There were no women bishops in the Bible. No women pastors in the Bible. I'm not afraid of, of Pastor Shirley Caesar. I told you all I tried to engage her at the airport one day, but she wouldn't talk. Anybody that gets close enough in my presence when I know they are not teaching what the word of God says, I try to engage them in the book. So you don't want your cousins around me talking like that, honey. Keep them away. I'm trying to please Jesus. There were no women overseers in the Bible. There were no women shepherds. In the New Testament Church of Christ. You know, I pulled down all the different translations that I have in my office. And I read this passage in each one of them. Do you all want to know my findings? I also have a Bible translation of 26 translations in one book. And I just want to show you how this passage has been translated in order to show what Paul meant when he said the husband of one wife. Some people think Paul meant one wife at a time. <laughs> I know that a polygamist and a bigamist and a bachelor cannot qualify for this position of a bishop. Do I have to say those three again? A polygamist, a bigamist, and a bachelor. <laughs> help me, Jesus. I see right now I'm not going to get any help up in here. Paul said the husband of one wife. So what does that mean? Somebody asked me one time, preacher, 
when the Bible says the husband of that of one wife, can you explain that? I said, yes. Let me tell you what it means when he says one. It means more than zero and less than two. <laughs> now, who in here can understand that? It bothers me how people act like they don't have any sense. Haven't gone to school. You know, you know, you all like matriculation, you know. They, but listen, you 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 just bother my mind when you act like you can't understand simple language. And then if I get up and say it as the Yuan Gilates, I'm gonna Yuan Gilizzo you with the Yuan Gizalon, and Yuan Gilion as I as the Kurox, you know, Crusoe. Brother Ho, you need to be plainer than that. Well, when I get plain, you say I'm country. And you can't understand my slur. Somebody needs to hear Jesus. Are you all paying attention? I need your attention with this because this qualification is a serious qualification. All of them are. But this one touches the lives of so many other people. The husband of one wife. Let me give you a few translations. The Berkeley version of the New Testament translates this verse. One wife's husband. Did y'all catch it? One wife's husband. The Williams translation of the New Testament translates it. Must have only one wife. You all caught that? The New English Bible translates it. Faithful to his one wife. The Morphet translation of the New Testament translates it. He must be married only once. Barclay's translation, not Richard Barclay, that you all know. I'm not talking about Richard. I, I'm talking about Williams. <laughs> now, it says, it translates it, being married only once. Phillips Morton translation translates it. He must be married to the one wife only. The exegesis Bible translates it. The husband, man of one wife, woman. West translation of the New Testament translates it. A one wife kind of man. That is married only once. Man, I even have Jimmy Swaggart's counselor's edition called the Expositor's New Testament. And he translates it. The husband of one wife is a caution, I believe, against polygamy, which in fact posed a serious problem for the church in those days. Man, if a denominational preacher puts something together and he tells the truth on this, You mean to tell me you can't believe the Bible? Now, I could go on, but I, I need to draw a conclusion. A man with more than one wife does not give a good picture of Christ and the church. Did you all catch what I just said? Christ has only one wife. You remember Ephesians 5.32? I won't do all of this stuff in Ephesians 5, 25. Husband, love your wives even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of the water by the word that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish so all men. I'm not going to do that. Read verse number 32. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Isn't that right? What are you trying to teach us, preacher? 
I'm trying to tell you that when a man desires the office of a bishop, his family life must reflect Christ. Now, 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 let me drop this on you because I know leaders' families must exemplify Christ. For the most part, most theologians believe one wife means just that, one wife. But now there, are, uh, there is one thing I think we have overlooked. And I want you all to follow me closely. Go to Matthew chapter 19, verse number 9. I want you to follow me closely. I don't want, any, I don't want anybody mistaking what I'm saying up in here today. Because I want to be clear. Because I know what's going to happen here. You're going to call your kinfolk and you're going to tell them Brother Holt said this. But when you call your kinfolk, you make sure you read the passage that I gave you. And then let them deal with the verses. Are you all paying attention? Now listen to what he said. Whosoever shall what? Put away his wife. I'm at Matthew chapter 19, verse number 9. And I say unto you, that whosoever shall put away his wife, except it be for what? Fornication. And marrieth her. Well, let me do this. Except it be for fornication, committeth adultery. And whosoever marrieth her, doeth also commit adultery. Now notice the exception that Jesus gives. One exception. Fornication. What is fornication? If you all would take out the time and look up that word fornicate and fornication, you'll go back and you'll find a Greek word. And that Greek word gives us our English word pornography. Prononia. Y'all pay attention. There's a whole lot of stuff in the Bible. We just don't see it because we don't study like we ought to. Pornography didn't just jump up. All of a sudden, the brother got his eyes stuck. <laughs> Man, this stuff been around a long time. They looking at pictures, nakedness in pictures, even back then. Y'all act like, like they didn't have artists. They didn't draw and stuff back then. <laughs> oh, Lord Jesus, please help me with this church. I've been trying to help you all for five years. And I'm still asking Jesus to help me. I'm trying to be like Solomon. You see, when God called Solomon over there as a young child, Solomon said, I'm just a lad. I'm just a child. I don't know how to lead your people. So give me an understanding that I can lead them in and lead them out. That's all I'm trying to do. Ask God to help me to help you. Isn't that fair enough? He said, whosoever shall put away his wife, accept it be for the call. Not because you found out she couldn't cook. <laughs> for the cause. Not for the cause she got fat. But I'll be in here by myself. <laughs> Not for that cause. Not for the cause I found out she was lazy. Not for that cause, but for the cause of fornication. Oh, Lord Jesus. Y'all sitting up in here like you, you, you done done something. <laughs> you know, from, from Mississippi, being from the country, we say stuff like, we act quite like that. What you city folk done done now? <laughs> Y'all act like you've done something. Jesus gave one exception to this rule of marriage. That is one man for one woman for one lifetime. If the spouse becomes unfaithful and commits sexual sin, that person is free to marry again. And if not, that person is not free to marry again. Now when a man puts away his spouse... For the cause of fornication, that man does not have two wives. He only has one. Now let me break this down. I know you're looking at me like, what in the world are you talking about? Watch this. Why would Jesus allow a man 
to put away his spouse and then punish him for doing so. Come on, y'all. When a person has a scriptural divorce, he or she does not have two wives or two husbands. Surely, God would not release you from a spouse and then at the same time hold you to that spouse. You all understand what the law of the excluded middle is, don't you? Uh oh, oh Lord Jesus. <laughs> a thing, the law of the excluded middle, simply means a thing cannot be and be at the same time. Got it? I know old preacher over there in, in, in Ohio, when he asked, he got it? They say, got it. He said, you sure you got it? They say, got it. He said, so when you understand this, say, got it. But somebody didn't understand. They didn't say, got it. <laughs> or you just don't want to participate. Ah, that's all right. You don't have to participate. We got a lot, a lot of non uh, participatory people in the church. But that's okay. I want you to hear me. When a man divorces his wife for the cause that Jesus gave, that man does not have two wives. Because if he still has two wives, he's a bigamist. In God's sight, not in man's. And if he has more than that, he's a polygamist. Jesus said there is only one reason, brother, why you can put away your wife. And if you don't do it for that reason, you are still married to her. Even though you went to the courthouse and they told you you can marry somebody else. The courthouse doesn't make the decision. Can't you see what the courthouse just did the other day on June 27th? The courthouse did that. I'm talking about the biggest courthouse we got in America. You know, people love Brother Clyde. They love to misunderstand me. But I'm trying to make it clear. So I want to drop this on the church. A congregation may not think that it is in the best interest of the congregation to select a man who has put away his wife for the cause of fornication, but that does not mean that he doesn't meet the qualification or that he does not satisfy the justice of God. Now, I, I, I have that written on my paper. Do I need to read it again? A congregation may not think it is in the best interest of the congregation to select a man who has put away his wife for the cause of fornication, but that does not mean that he doesn't meet this qualification or that he does not satisfy the justice of God. You see, this will always be a problem in the church of Christ. But I think we as preachers must help people to understand more assuredly what God, or more accurately what God has said. So I say to any divorced man in here, if you divorce that woman because of fornication, God doesn't have a problem with you. And since God doesn't have a problem with you, I don't either. I'm just telling it like I read it. I didn't ask for anybody to just, uh, you know, stand with me. I just want to tell you what the Bible says. When a man dies, that's not an exception, honey. That's just due order. His wife marries another. Or if the wife dies and the man marries another, all that is in Romans chapter 7, verses 1 through 6. So I'm not going to, you know, belabor that point. But I have to get you to understand. 
Sometimes when the Bible talks about divorce, he's not dealing with the exception to the rule. He's just dealing with the rule. But Jesus deals not just with the rule. Jesus deals with the exception to the rule. So let me drop this on you while I'm passing by on this thing called divorce. The church really needs to learn how to deal with divorced people. We should not isolate them in the congregation like they have leprosy or something. Divorce can happen to anybody. You just say you've been blessed. Because the way some of us have messed up, by the grace of God, your spouse stayed with you. You don't have to say amen to my preacher. Because if I wanted amen, I go to Ephesians chapter 3, verse number 21, find me one. <laughs> I know we don't talk much about, you know, the wives of elders. But that is something we need to consider. Paul talks about a man ruling his own house well. Isn't that right? Now watch this. Sometimes we think Paul is just talking about a man just ruling his children. But Paul has a wife in mind also. How can you say? This goes way back to Genesis 3, verse 16. Let's check it out. You talk about a golden thread from the book of Genesis, man, all the way through the book of Revelation. God taught the same thing in every dispensation of time. What do you mean by that every dispensation of time? In every period of time, from the patriarchal period to the mosaic period until today, the Christian period, God has taught the same thing that a woman ought to submit to her husband. Here in Genesis 3, verse number 16, and I know, I know society is changing. We look at it now, the one with the most sense, go get the job. And the other that doesn't have that must stay at home, keep children. You mean to tell me you're going to leave a man at home that you just concluded didn't have much sense to keep the children? <laughs> I better leave you all alone. I'm going to get kicked out of this church one day. Oh, Lord Jesus. Did I really mean to say that? <laughs> yes, I did. Are you in Genesis 3.16? Unto the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. Somebody ought to shake the head, pat the feet or something. God never changed his mind on this teaching. I said God never. Ephesians 5, 23, I said God never changed his mind. Did you hear me? For as the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the savior of the body. Did God change his mind? Watch verse 24. Come on up. Watch verse 24. Mm. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be. He didn't say subject. Just say let the wives be to their own husband. He didn't have to repeat it. Some people call that's a continuation. Some smart folks say it's in the present active indicative mood. Let's tell us anything. Oh, we don't know any better. But the wife is to be what? Subject to a husband. Yeah, oh, that's right. That's right. Thank you. Yes, sir, man. I preached at a church, man, and Sister decided she's going to cook me sweet potato pie. 
cook and say, well, now she, she doesn't cook me sweet potato pies. So I had, I had to give her this verse. Give it to him. <laughs> Don't send it up here. <laughs> I'm fat enough. Are you all paying attention? You got to watch me on this. I know someone will say, when Paul wrote concerning the elder, it doesn't address the women or the wives of the elders. We hear a lot of different things when we talk about the wives of the elders. Now, before you draw that conclusion, let me help you with something that I believe in a contextual setting will make us free or will set us free in our thinking. You remember the qualifications he gave of a deacon? In 1 Timothy chapter 3, uh, verses 8 through uh, 13, I want you to come back there with me for just a moment. 1 Timothy chapter 3. But what I want to do, I want to look at in particular verses 11 and 12. You all get to verses 11 and 12? I'm in 1 Timothy chapter 3. Now listen to what he says. Even so must their wives be grave, not slanderous, sober, faithful in all things. Let the deacons be the husbands of one wife, ruling their own, their children and their own houses well. Now he's not talking about elders here. He's talking about deacons. Did you catch this language? Now watch the deacons why it must, not, must be grave, not slanderous, sober, faithful in all things. Let the deacons why be the husband, let the deacons rather be the husband of one wife, ruling their children and their own houses. What? Well, if the deacons' wives ought to be faithful in all things. What about the elders' wives? Can the elders' wives be slanderous? Shouldn't they be sober and grave? Which means honorable and honest. Sisters, if everybody in the church knows that you are disrespectful to your husband and you wear the britches in the house, please don't encourage your husband to become an elder or a deacon. If you already know you ruling, I'm just trying to help somebody. I don't mean it harm. Jerry and Joe were best friends. And while Jerry and Joe lived on this earth, Jerry knew that Joe was hen pecked. And Joe would say, Yeah, my hen that pecked me. But one day, Joe and Jerry died. Every time, man, uh, Joe got ready to do something, he went and asked his wife. So Jerry knew Joe was in pain. But when they died and they both got up to heaven, and man, there was a line that said, men and henpeck men. Jerry looked up and saw Joe in the line that said men. Jerry said, Joe, man, you know when you on earth, your wife always told you what to do. You were in pain. What you doing over in this line that said, man? He said, my wife told me to come over here. <laughs> Listen, church. I'm trying to be for real with you all. <laughs> because I really need you to understand this. Anytime a woman disrespects her husband, anytime a woman tries to exercise dominion over her husband, it puts the family in danger. Not just with God. Yes, God is not pleased, but the family is going to be out of order. Your children hear you talk to their daddy any kind of way. They follow you. They talk to him like that. But back in Mississippi, I'll snatch a knot in mine. 
next. That's the few in their next. Don't talk to me like that. Lord is quiet in here. <laughs> I'm just trying to help these women. How you deal with your husbands. Sometimes it will determine whether or not they can be qualified for an elder or not qualified for an elder. Be careful how you treat your husband. Y'all need to talk about these women. Don't come up here telling me, oh, he's just anti-women. He doesn't like women. Honey, I've been in love with women ever since I found out I wasn't one. So no, no, don't come telling me that. <laughs> what about you, brother? I love you, you know. And I put him in this. In Colossians chapter 3 and verse number 18, I'm almost finished. You can believe me, I'm almost finished. The Bible says, why submit yourself unto your own husband as it is fit in the Lord. The term submit in this text comes from a Greek word, hupotasso. Hupotasso simply means to subordinate. It means to be under. It means to be subjected to. You remember Ephesians 5 and verse number uh, 24 therefore as the church is subject unto Christ so let the wives be to their own husband in everything let me say this to potential elders wives you can help your husband or you can hurt your husband potential wives elders wives all of this cussing and drinking and loud talking and being busy bodies and other people's matters and being the church gossiper will hinder your husband I know y'all don't like it, but I have to preach it. I have to preach the gospel in season and out of season. I have to be ready at all times to speak a word from the Lord. I'm not trying to make enemies. We need some good elders in this church. Am I correct about it? And so if I want to get more specific, we need some more good elders in this church. I don't run out of here saying, you know, I interpreted that to mean we didn't have any good ones. <laughs> People love to misrepresent you, so you better be clear. Potential elders' wives, you need to know now. Just because your husband becomes an elder does not give you special privileges in the church. Thought I tell you that I don't mean you any harm, and I hope you don't mean me any. I don't mean you any harm. But where you base what you base that upon? I base it upon a principle of James chapter two. I said I base it upon a principle. Important people sometimes have a mindset that they're more than others. I'm talking about important people. See, if you just see yourself as a member of the body, you don't see yourself more important than other people. I see myself as just the preacher of this church. That's it. A servant of this church. That's it. A minister of this church. That's it. An evangelist of this church. That's it. I see myself as a servant of God. I'm not trying to run you, rule you, or ruin you. You see, God lays out his word on how we ought to live as a child of his. In James chapter 2, my brethren, have not the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with respect to persons? Now I want you to catch this. Because Jesus has no respect a person. For if there come unto your assembly a man with a gold ring and goodly apparel, and there come in also a poor man in vile raiment, and ye have respect to him that weareth the gay clothing, and say unto him that sit thou here in a good place, or say to the poor, stand thou there, or sit here under my feet. 
I preached, man, for a church. The treasurer didn't like me. <laughs> well, I had some hard days in this church of Christ, boy, I tell you. <laughs> and the man wrote my check. The treasurer didn't like me, didn't like the preacher. And every man Friday, I get my check and slides it under my door. You know, I'm trying to be a good Christian. I just get on my knees and say, thank you, Jesus, get my check. <laughs> yeah, I'm thanking Jesus, trying to keep my check. But now one day, the old brutal start fluffing. I said, I'm not going to take this another, another Friday. I said, look, man, let me tell you something. I've been trying to be nice to you. I've been bowing to you and thanking God while I'm on my knees for my check. I said, but I have a box out there, and next Friday I want my check in that box. So I got my check out the box from then on. What am I telling you? You want to get stuff straight, you sometimes have to confront issues. You don't confront issues. You're not going to get anything straight. You're not going to work out any, uh, you know, problems. And you're going to just go through life being dogged. So you have to stand up sometimes for yourself. And it's not about Daryl Holt, but I give you all of these illustrations because I lived them. So Paul did the same thing. And you'd be surprised, man, the things Paul talked about and what he went through. But you're not Paul. I know it. I just read 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse number 1. Be ye therefore followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. That's all. So, 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 listen. Men, you want to become elders in the church? Keep in mind, if a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. A bishop then must, y'all remember we talked about must. It's not optional, is it? Must be blameless. Not sinless. Because we all sin. But you must live above reproach. Then he says the husband of one wife. And next week, I'm going to go further. I won't spend that much time on each one of those qualifications that's coming up because they don't, I don't believe they demand that much time. But where I believe we really need to spend some time, I'm going to spend some time. So I want all of you to know, this is not Daryl Holt's church. This church was here before I got here. And I'm not trying to make it mine. All I'm trying to do is tell what I believe to be the truth. And I'm not trying to upset anybody. I'm just trying to teach the gospel of Christ. That's all I'm trying to do. If you're here and you're not a Christian, a member of the church of Christ, God has a simple plan of salvation. Acts 15 and verse 7. When there had been much disputing, Peter rose up, said to them, Men and brethren, you know that a good while ago that God made choice among us that the Gentiles by my mouth should hear the word of the gospel and believe. You know in Acts chapter 18 and verse 8, Crispus the chief ruler of the synagogue believed on the Lord with all his house and many of the Corinthians hearing believed and were baptized. Everybody in the first century church to get in it, they were baptized. You don't get in the church of Christ without being baptized. You have to be baptized for the remission of your sins, Acts 2.38. Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Is that your desire? Song leader, I just need you to come on up. I'm finished. I, I won't bore them any longer. You want to come to Jesus? He's calling now. Come on. I am with somebody one ought to say yes to Jesus. Thy blood. 
He's knocking at the door of your heart. He's asking you to let him in. Somebody say yes to the master. O Lamb, O Lamb of God. He said yes for you. Haven't you waited long enough? 